today on Ask This Old House. You don't feel it on a summer day like today, but in the winter, my hands get dry. I get a zap from the static when I touch the outlet. Sure. Up here in the mountains, the air can get a bit dry. I'm heading to Park City, Utah to help a house get a little more comfortable. These containers are great every summer, but they don't last through the winter. I've got some ideas to fix that. Do you know the difference between a 3 8 lag screw and a number 14 wood screw? Well, I'll help you decode screw terminology. And did you know that where you live affects how you pay for electricity? I'll walk you through the different types of billing and give you some advice on how to save money. Are you Mike? I am. I'm glad. Hi Richard. Welcome to Park City. Nice to be here. Now Park City is down there in the valley and that's at what, 7,000 foot elevation. Yeah. You're up here on the ridge top. What a spot. How'd you get here? Well, the house. We fell in love with it and yes. moved in about a year ago. The views inside must be unreal. Yeah, it's really incredible. Now you wrote me about humidity. Yes. Let me take you inside. Well, this feels like the perfect place to daydream all day. Absolutely. It's beautiful, but it sure is dry. You don't feel it on a summer day like today, but in the winter, my hands get dry. I get a zap from the static when I touch the outlet. Sure. Well, it's a common complaint. We hear it all the time. It's probably even worse out here in the high mountains where the air can get even drier. Anytime we hear about that condition, we think about adding a whole house humidifier. Typically, the house has a ducted system. That's how most houses in America are heated and cooled. And so we just put that humidifier on the side of the ductwork, and the fan would move that moist air through the ductwork, out through the register, and blend it all in. But you said in your email you had a radiant flow heating system. Exactly. That's going to require a little different solution. Let's go check the mechanical room. Now you can watch this old house and ask this old house anytime, anywhere. Download our new app to stream full episodes to your tablet, your TV, and your phone. Binge on classic episodes, catch up on recent renovations, and get step-by-step -step help projects all around the house. And best of all, it's free. The most trusted home improvement information is now available on your Amazon Fire TV, Roku, Apple TV, iOS, and Android devices. Download the This Old House streaming app today. You got a nice, big, beautiful mechanical room here. Thank you. All right, let's talk humidity. This is a sanded steam humidifier right here. If you open up the cover, it has a canister right here that'll be filled about two thirds of the way with water. I brought a little cutaway right here inside the canister. You can see there are two elements that are immersed into the water. And when electricity is applied, by conduction, electricity will pass between these two elements and it'll excite the water enough to change its state from water to steam. Got it. Now steam will leave out through the top right here. Minerals will drop to the bottom. So out through the top, steam will leave, go mm -hmm. through this hose right here. Now if you had a ducted system, we'd use something like this, a wand that would let steam go into the ductwork and then the fan would push air across it, grabbing that humidity and putting it through the ductwork. Mm -hmm. But you don't. So we need the second component right here, which is this fan box. The hose will send steam right here and steam will come out here. But there's a little fan right here that'll draw air in from the room, across the fan, and then back out here to mix with the steam and deliver it into the space. Now, there are three connections we need to make to the steam generation unit. One is water, which we got right here. The other is a drain, which is perfect right there. And electricity is perfect right close. So, okay. somewhere in here feels like the right location for the unit that's going to generate the steam. Right. The other component we have to think about carefully where we place it is this fan pack. And that has to be in the right location inside the conditioned space. So if we introduce humidity into the space, it'll equalize through the whole building, even without ductwork. Okay. So in general, this is a perfect location right here to introduce humidity. We're right behind the mechanical room here. Great. But if I put this onto the wall here, and this is highly concentrated, I'd worry about too much humidity coming here onto these surfaces and causing mold. So there's a prohibition about where you place it. It's two foot clearance from side to side, five feet up, and a foot and a half down. Guess where the perfect location in your entire house is? It's right where this light is. What do you think of this light? It's not great. We can move it. That's the perfect answer. Yeah, all right. Local HVAC technicians Josh and David will be helping us with the installation today. They start by mounting the unit on the mechanical side of the room. 
With the light removed and the hole cut to fit the fan box, David can slide the fan box into position and secure it to the wall with some screws. Then, it's time to make all the water connections. David starts at the fan box and attaches the wand to a series of copper pipes that connect to the steam unit. Then, they run some PVC pipes down to the drain on the floor. Finally, they can connect the unit to the water supply and also make their electrical connections to power the unit. All right, so the last piece to connect is a device to control the humidifier itself. It's called a humidistat. Pretty okay. simple to operate. You got up and down arrows to set the relative humidity that you're looking for, and on and off buttons right here. Okay, and what should I be looking for in terms of the humidity? Well, that depends. I mean, I think ideal humidity is somewhere between 30 and 40%. But okay. you gotta be careful as you get into the really coldest days of the winter. If you have too much humidity, you've got cold surfaces here, condensation yeah. can form on the windows, okay? But I want you to enjoy this, my friend. Great, thanks for coming to Park City. My pleasure. Enjoy your little piece of heaven. Thank you. Hmm. Nice job, Richard. Thank you, nice place to visit. Yeah, I bet. So when I see that, a little bit of work went into it. Sure. I'm thinking to myself, why not a room humidifier or even tool? You certainly could, but this is indeed what its name suggests. It's a room humidifier. So you put it in an individual room. As you use it, water will go down. You have to refill it. Right. The steam's coming out through the top right here. It looks similar to what we'd get out of our wall pack. But if you really have a whole house, this is not the way to do it. You have to have too many of them and have to be maintaining them all the time. Yeah, and it is super dry out yeah. there. So then what's the maintenance on the device you put in? Well, this is the canister that I cut away, uh, cut apart. You know, there's a couple of connections. The two electrical connections here. There's water and drain out the bottom. And this thing, depending on the water quality, if you've got high calcium, high minerals, it could probably clog up in a year maybe, but it could go a little more, maybe every a year, year or two or three, okay? And to replace it, it costs what? It's about 100 bucks, I think, for that, so it's not, not comp really cheap. At least it'll tell you, there's a, there's a call out light on there right. that'll tell you when this thing has to be replaced. Okay, although 100 bucks potentially a year, plus the operational cost, that's right. not nothing. That's right. There's another alternative, uh, another unit on the market, uh, uh, it's a little more money on the front end, but what they did is they made this component out of stainless steel. So this canister does not have to be replaced. And yeah, this is nice. an immersion element that you can pretty much keep clean. So this would be a little more on the front, but less maintenance on the back side. Got it. Okay? okay. But either way, if you lived in a place like that with it's dry, dry, dry up in the mountains, you need one of these solutions. Got it. All right. Good information. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks. Want to tackle all your home improvement projects with confidence? Join This Old House Insider a new streaming service from this old house, the iconic Emmy-winning series that inspired a generation of home enthusiasts. Stream over 1,000 episodes of This Old House and Ask This Old House commercial free. Watch it all in the This Old House app and join live online Q&As with our experts. Best of all, you can try Insider free for seven days. To join, go to thisoldhousemembership.com. Tommy, I got the screw you asked for. And the nail, and the nut, and the bolt, and everything else. Yeah, you, you laugh. These little jars with assortment of screws, nuts, and washes are handy to have. You never know if you're missing just that one screw. In a pinch, maybe. But I think people could probably do better if they knew what they were looking for when they went looking for screws and it's, bolts and nails. That's true. And there's a lot of different sizes and different things. All right, first of all, this is a lag screw, even though it has a hex head. Mm -hmm. All right, this is meant for wood. If you look at the thread, it's a coarse thread. That means wood. If you look at this, this is a carriage bolt. It has a machine thread. It's fine thread, and there's no way to screw that into material. So you have to drill a hole, and you want to use a mechanical faster. So you're going to use a washer, and then you put the nut on that. And yep. now that's great for screwing things like a post to a deck or two pieces of framing material together, or just a lot of different yeah. things. And that, cinch that down tight, that's not gonna go anywhere. Yeah. Let's set the, the bolts aside for a second and talk about screws, because there's more application in our world for those. Yep. There's a whole bunch of different kinds for a whole bunch of different purposes. Right, and I guess the most common people say, they go to the store and they say, well, I want a screw, so let's grab some drywall screws. And why not, use them for everything. <laughs> well, and they're relatively inexpensive but they shouldn't be used for everything. So why is that? It's not a structural screw. So what does that mean, they're not a structural screw? Well, it means that it doesn't have a lot of tinsel strength. It, it's brittle. Yep. So if you're, if you're 
many people have done it. You try to screw a piece of wood to something and it gets in there and all of a sudden the screw snaps off. Snaps right off. Right. So you wouldn't want to use it for hanging something heavy. Not cabinetry and stuff like that. Perfectly yeah, fine though for drywall. Right. Now, if you look at the thread of the drywall screw, it goes all the way up because this is meant to go through a soft material and goes right through and it's not going to pull back mm -hmm. and it grabs well. If you're, if you're screwing something into hardwood, you want a finer thread and drywall screw actually comes with a real fine thread for screwing into steel studs. Mm, interesting. I think people are familiar for sure with the, uh, the slotted head right there, the flat head right. and the Phillips for sure. Yeah, and there's Torx. Yeah, which is a sort of a star shape, different sizes. Right, and I prefer the Torx head today because they grab well and they don't strip out. All right, so different types of heads. Yep. Now, if you are looking for screws, they've got a coating system. Yep. Um, they've got a length, a number. Explain that to us. Yeah, so you'd go to the home center and all these screws have a label on it. Like this is a 10 by 2, mm. all right? Okay. All right, the 10 is the diameter and the 2 is the length overall. So the 10 is like a gauge number? Right. And as you go up in gauge, 10, 12, 14, those become bigger yeah, screws. Yeah, so here's a 14 by 3 and a half. Gotcha. All right, so heavier, the heavier, bigger the number, the higher. So if you're buying them, it's right on the package. That makes a lot of sense. But if you're taking that one screw out from, say, the hinge where you've got the stripped head and you've got to match it, mm. you're not sure what you're looking for. Right. Well, you can buy one of these gauges like this and keep it in your home shop. or. The home centers and the hardware stores have them mounted right below the screws and you can take the screw that you want to match and you try to put it into the hole that it fits and that's a 10, number 10 screw. And now if you want to know the length, you take the screw and you hold it into the gauge tight at the top and it tells you that's two inches long. Oh, interesting. It's even got a little triangle cut out there to help you. Right. Seats right on there. In terms of length, what's the rule of thumb for how long of a screw you should use depending on what you're putting together? Well, that's very important, I think. The rule of thumb for, for finding the screw length is take the material thickness and multiply it times two and a half. The material thickness of what you're trying to attach, so right. like a half inch drywall, you take the half inch versus the right. inch and a half stuff. Okay, so let's say half inch drywall, two and a half would be inch and a quarter screw. Right. Five eighths drywall will be an inch and nine sixteenths, so inch and five eighths screw. Yeah, interesting. All right, so that's very important. It's important that you use the screw that's going to grab yeah. what it needs to grab and hold what you want it to hold. Okay, so last question for you drywall screw inside, obviously. Exactly. I mean, that drywall screw that's black, that's for interior. These zinc screws are interior. You don't want to be using these screws outside because they can rust. You want to use a screw that could be stainless, it could be galvanized, it could be ceramic coated, mm -hmm. but you want to make sure that it's rated for exterior use and also rated for pressure treated use right. because it could rot if it's the wrong material. All right, Tommy, good information. Thank you. My pleasure. Have one. Oh, thanks. Hi, Kate. Hey, Jen. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Thank you so much for coming out. This is beautiful. I love your home. I love this entryway. You want to tell me a little bit about sure. it? Sure. Yeah, no, we fell in love with the house right away, um, that kind of classic colonial style, but especially the portico. Mm -hmm. um, and we really love the idea of these um, containers um, kind of flanking the front door. But as you can see, I've really struggled keeping keeping the plants alive. Right. Well, the containers are beautiful, and these look like they were boxwoods. They were. Many months ago, they were, yes. <laughs> well, I, th I think having a broadleaf evergreen, which these boxwoods are, mm -hmm. um, is great to mark the entryway. And okay. a broadleaf evergreen just means it's going to stay green year round. OK. Um, mm -hmm. But a lot of times when plants are above ground here in New England, mm -hmm. the frost and freeze can affect the root system. Yes. So if this was in the ground, it would be fine. Mm -hmm. um, I would love to replant mm -hmm. what you have here, but I have some tips to help it last throughout four seasons instead of two. All right, awesome. Let's get to it. All right, let's do it. Okay, so what I want to do is add some insulation to this planter. Uh, this is a piece of rigid foam. You okay. can get it from any home center. It's one inch thick and it's going to protect the root system, just insulate it through the winter. Mm -hmm. So what I want to do is measure the planter. I want to keep it below the soil line, so I'm going to cut it at 15 inches. And then 15 by 18. So we need four sides, 15 by 18 inches. Nice. Perfect. Let's 
See how easy that was? Yeah, Good job. Great. So these drainage holes at the bottom of the pot, I'm going to cover with shards of terracotta so soil doesn't clog and prevent it from draining. So Jen, I see that you're stacking the pottery shards in little kind of piles. Is there a reason that you do it that way? I want the water to be able to penetrate through and I want the drainage holes to stay clear. Okay. Okay, can you give me a piece of landscape fabric? I'm just going to put it on top. And what's this fabric for? It's a separation. Number one, I'll hold the shards in place, and then it, the water will penetrate through it, but it also separates the soil from bleeding and washing out through the holes. Okay. And then one more piece of the fabric, just a little double layer. Okay, let's start by putting handfuls of this organic potty mix on top of the landscape fabric to hold it in place. Then we'll dump the rest of the bag in. All right, that should be good. Yours looks good. Let's just dump the rest of the bag in, kind of the halfway mark. So these are our new boxwoods. Let's just pick them up, put them in the planter to check the height, just so we're at the right soil level. Wow, it looks great. I love it. So now we're just gonna take them out of the pot this one's not too bad, it's just it's a little bit root bound at the bottom. All right, I'm just going to tease these roots a little bit. This is definitely a step that I've skipped in the past. I didn't realize that was something that would help them grow. Yeah, just breaking them up will help them not grow in a circular fashion and they'll reach out to the soil. All right, we just want to make sure they're centered in the pot for the symmetry at the front door. Okay, mine looks pretty good. So does mine, perfect. All right, so now let's backfill okay. around the root ball, maybe three quarters of the way up. Okay. So we're gonna underplant the boxwood mm -hmm. with this ivy, and I got them in bigger containers and more mature, so they'll automatically start cascading off the edges. Okay, great. And you just kind of rip them apart um, to kind of get the smaller pieces that you need as the underplanting? Exactly. So I think one of these containers could break into four different pieces. Okay, that doesn't hurt them? Nope, just once they're watered in, they'll be great. So everything's installed. What do you think, Kate? Wow, Jen, they look amazing. Total transformation. It really anchors this front entryway. A uh, couple things I want you to remember is under the portico, mm -hmm. it's not going to get any rainwater. Okay. So I want you to hydrate, water it all the way until the end of the season, okay. at least until November. Okay. And another way that plants lose their moisture is through their leaves. Okay. So I'm going to leave you with a bottle of anti-desiccant spray okay. that you apply mm -hmm. at the end of the season, and it'll help seal the pores so okay. when the winds rip through. Yeah, great. A little more protected. Well, that is definitely one step I've skipped in the past. Thank All right. you so much. Enjoy. Jen. Thanks Thank for you. coming over. Take care. Nice job, Jen. Thanks. So spraying the plant at the end of the season, that's a step that I think most people skip. I mean, it's kind of a subtle point that the wind can dry out the plant, not just a you know, dry soil. That's true. So at the end of the season, always water your plant in, but a plant takes up moisture through the roots, and it's held and stored in these leaves. When you put the anti-desiccant on, you spray it on both sides of the leaves, and it helps seal the pores. So when winter cold winds are ripping through, it's not going to rob that plant of its moisture. So what does it look like when it's actually on there? Like, am I going to notice it as a, as a homeowner? Well, check it out. You just really want to drench it. It's going to dry. It might leave a little bit of a shiny coat, but then it's just, it's sealed. Mm. And if you want to compare it to something, it's like putting lip balm on so you don't get windburn. And then they're ready for the winter season. All right, good information. As yeah. always, thank you. Well, Ross, you know better than probably anybody, there's some stuff I don't get, you know, <laughs> the internet, <laughs> online billing, you know, sure, change my sure. password. I'll help you with that. But what I really don't get is my electric bill. In the old days, every month you get a bill from the local Edison, they called it back then. Yeah. It was measuring kilowatt hours, it was simple. But nowadays, you open up a bill, you don't know what, right, what you're paying. Right. So the standard way of, of billing is called a fixed rate based on your kilowatt hour of usage. Yeah. So the example I give is that if you have a 100 watt light bulb, you turn that light bulb yeah. on, it consumes 100 watts yeah. every instant. But if I run it for one hour, it's 100 watt hours. So you multiply that 
by something to get a kilowatt hour. Right, so one tenth of a kilowatt hour, in that example. Okay. But what changed it all is deregulation. Okay. Okay, with a deregulated model, the electricity company that's usually highly regulated that controls the generation of the electricity, right. the transmission, and the delivery to every single house, right. with deregulation, now the generation is by any company. So it could be from far away exactly. and come across the so lines. What does that do? It's competition, which drives in the prices for consumers, but they've also changed the billing structures. Okay. Right, so one of the models that they've adopted is called demand charges or peak pricing. Okay. With that model, you're charging homeowners a fixed rate of electricity that's tiered based on how much electricity they used in a 15 minute window for the month. So how do you change that tier? What happens? Right, so if I turn on a lot of light bulbs or a lot of compressors or a lot of loads in a house, I'm gonna draw a lot of electricity all in a 15 minute window, and that's gonna put me into a different tier. So how long do you stay in that tier? For the whole month. Ooh, well, that doesn't sound very good. You could be penalized in a big way for having a bad couple of minutes. Yeah, and it's tricky because you don't know, yeah. right? You don't know how much energy you're right. using at different right. times, so right. you would have no idea. So is that a popular model? So yeah, it's not a popular model, thankfully. Yeah. It's not used in many parts of the country, yeah. but one that is used in a lot of parts is called time of use. Okay. And with time of use rates, they're charging you a set rate of electricity for different times of the day. Okay. So if you think about it from 9 uh, a.m. to 9 p.m., for example, that window, it may be at a very high rate of electricity, but off peak, meaning from 9 p.m. Mm. through the night, it's actually gonna be at a lower peak. And I could get that. You got X amount of power plants and you got all these people trying to demand too much right then. So I get that and they would raise their rates. That's supply and demand. My advice for most homeowners is to break the home and the electrical devices into three categories, okay. right? So one is no control. Right, so the refrigerator of the house, the well pump if you have one, yeah. that really, you really have no control over sure, that. Sure, you right? don't want to turn them off. That's right. The next category is some control. So that would be like your HVAC, right? Sure. I can change the set point lower or yeah. higher to get past a certain period of time. Right. Eventually it's gonna turn yeah. back on, but that's some control. Full control will be the appliances that literally you have full control over. So you, when you run your, your dishwasher, sure. right? I can pick and choose or run it at 9 p.m., set right. the timer to run yeah. later. And when they the all have a timer now. That's yeah. right, the yeah. big one, electric cars nowadays, they consume a ton of electricity, sure. and it's best to do that at night. Yeah. Another item to look for is what's called ghost power or phantom power. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't understand this, but you can have a device that's actually plugged into the wall right. that is turned off, but it still consumes electricity. There's a, and there's a lot of them, right? Phone chargers, clock radios, yep. modems, so printers. The, every clock and every microwave and right. every oven. Right. It actually equates to almost a quarter of the, your electric bill in your average house. I think people would be surprised if they realized how much, how much it was using. Yeah, it's a big deal. Right. Yeah. I often think about how we're gonna change people's behaviors for electricity, and you got me to put that device into my house, which is so cool, because I could then see my, my recessed can lights and how much they use, right. and it was crazy. Real-time really, data. Right, it really made me change how I do electricity at the house. Right, you leave those lights off now, right? That's right, I do. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. So what uh, utility companies are doing is they're now retrofitting buildings with smart meters. And what that allows them to do is actually have much better control of their grid because they can see real-time, just like that device does, yeah. this device right. is gonna tell the utility company what, uh, what, they're, what the grid is doing, what that house is doing real time. Do you imagine a day where they what might be able to control Maybe. some of those devices you talked about? Lot, there's a lot of talk going on right now about where that future is going. And there could be a day where the actual electric meter yeah. and the utility company has the ability to control all or some of the devices yeah. inside the house. Yeah. So if the grid is getting overtaxed, what yeah. they'll do is they'll yeah. pull out your water heater or pull out some of those and drop off some of those right. appliances right. to save on the grid. Yeah. And uh, it, you know, we'll see if it goes there, but uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting angle. You're really smart, but I still don't really understand my electric bill. <laughs> don't worry, I'll have it. <laughs>